bits of content just for li uh, locals uh, uh, viewers and um, where I also do by the way live streams every Wednesday secondly I would say that obviously it's not entirely easy to keep track of the pace of events in the Ukraine crisis which um, to put it mildly uh, they're very intense and they change almost from hour to hour um, if you want to get a sense of what's going on I strongly recommend that you go to locals and you see the regular updates that my colleague and friend Alex Christoforo has been posting. Thirdly, we have been doing a number of live streams about the crisis um, in Ukraine, which appear in our Rumble, in our, uh, uh, sorry, in, on our Duran channel, which you can also, by the way, find on Locals. And can I say that various, uh, various uh, contributors have also joined our live streams, notably Gonzalo Lira, who is actually there on the spot in Kiev and who is able to report on events from the ground, so to speak, giving a very good sense of the kind of things that are going on. So those are just a few informative pieces of information before I now proceed with this programme. And this time I am afraid I'm going to make this programme rather short because it seems to me that we are now beyond the point of analysis. We're more at the stage of reporting. And as I said, for reporting, perhaps the best place to go would be Alex's regular updates on Locals, which you can find on Locals, and our live streams where you can also hear what Gonzalo Lira, um, our friend, on, this, on the scene in Kiev is actually reporting. But to say that doesn't mean that there is no analysis that can be made at all. And um, as well as analysis, let me first of all provide my own opinion. There's been some discussion, some uh, uh, um, commentary in the Western media over the last few hours that the brave resistance of the Ukrainian people has supposedly stopped the advance of the Russian armies in their track, in their tracks. And I think this is partly based on events in Kiev, where uh, some people perhaps expected uh, a, a, a uh, the tanks to roll into the center of the city overnight and where of course that hasn't actually happened. I have to say that I take these claims of brave resistance successfully keeping an army at bay, an entire army at bay, very much with a pinch of salt. In fact, to be straightforward about it, I don't believe them. I've heard these sort of claims made many times in many conflicts. I can remember similar claims being made at the time of the Solidarnosc protests in Poland and during the part point time when martial law was imposed in Poland in 1981. I remember similar claims being made at the time of the Tiananmen Square crisis in Beijing in 1989 um, and I've heard this on other occasions and in other places including by the way during the conflict in Iraq. I have to say straight away that I think that these sort of claims misunderstand the dynamic of war. In the case of uh, the conflict in Ukraine it seems to me that after their extremely rapid advances on the first couple of hours, it is completely understandable that the Russian forces should have uh, stopped to consolidate before they make any, step, any, uh, any decision to advance into the centre of cities. Certainly, I would have thought that before they take a step like that, that they would want to undertake intense reconnaissance to find out what is actually going on inside those cities and the nature and extent of the resistance they might encounter and where that resistance might be located, where its headquarters might be, what sort of resources it could draw upon and where it might be able to cr f uh, um, create the major, the major difficulties. In the case of the Russians, I would say that they have 
bitter experience of this. In 1994, in Chechnya, the Russian army, under orders from President Yeltsin, thought that it could drive straight into the Chechen capital, Grozny, unopposed. As a result, proper reconnaissance of Grozny was not carried out, and the troops going in without proper preparation fell into all sorts of traps and had to withdraw in some um, in some disarray. I think that the Russians will never allow th something like that to happen to themselves in Ukraine and before they advance into the cities they will make quite sure that they know exactly what it is that they're going to be up against. I would say in addition that the Russian authorities are claiming that to the extent that there was a pause, that the reason for the pause was that they were getting contradictory signals from President Zelensky and Ukraine over the course of fr uh, Friday, uh, with Zelensky apparently saying that he wanted negotiations and talk of negotiations taking place in various places, but those negotiations never crystallizing. So uh, allegedly, according to the Russian authorities, and I stress this is the Russian authorities who are saying this, I have no way of verifying or corroborating to what extent this is true, but allegedly President Putin, midway, midway through Friday, um, ordered a stop on Russian military advances to allow time and space for negotiations to begin. When that didn't happen, he waited for some hours, but that he has recently ordered that the advances to resume, and they are expected now to resume over the course of late Saturday. In any event, I don't think this changes the military picture at all. I think the idea that the brave Ukrainians by themselves can take on the might of the Russian army is, I think, foolish fantasizing, as I suspect, will become clear over the next few days or weeks at most. And I would say, and here I fully concur with comments made from the scene of the action by Gonzalo Lira on our live stream on the Duran. He has spoken of the irresponsible actions of some people in Kiev who have apparently distributed small arms to the civilian population and are trying to conscript men um, between the ages of 18 and 55 into some kind of hurriedly organised defence of the capital. I think this move is misconceived at multiple levels. Um, according to Gonzalo Lira, and this is also, by the way, supported by other reports I've seen, this massive distribution of arms has ensured that some of those arms have got into the hands of some of the more restless members of Kiev's population, including its criminal classes. This has led to gunfights in some places, supposedly. This has even apparently led to looting in some places too, none of which would surprise me. Also, the decision to order a mass mobilisation of men has caused many of them to flee the city, something which, by the way, I would strongly encourage them to do. I think sending uh, untrained men into battle, civilians into battle, against a professional army backed by tanks, artillery, uh, all kinds of machinery that I'm not really in a position to discuss. Um, I think that is completely irresponsible. It is akin to sending people to their death. That is what Gonzalo Lira said, and I agree. By the way, and for the record, I have come across people who talk to me about the same thing in Germany during the Battle of Berlin in 1945, something like that also happened, though not perhaps on quite the scale, which has been talked about in Kiev, and the results were tragic, to put it mildly. A far better policy, a far wiser approach by the authorities in Kiev would have been to do 
what the authorities in Donetsk and Lugansk did or said they were doing last week, which is to evacuate the civilian population from the city. Now, um, until just a few days ago, I actually saw a report on the RT website of all places, which said that the government, the city government of Kiev, led by Mayor Klitschko, actually had plans for precisely such an evacuation. Well, if they did have such plans, they are obviously not being implemented. And given the extent of the disorganization and the chaos, I wonder whether, in fact, these plans ever really did exist. So this is completely irresponsible. It's also irresponsible, if it is true, as some are saying, to move heavy weapons into the centre of the city. Um, Gonzalo Lira fears that this is intended precisely to create civilian casualties in order to um, swing world opinion behind Ukraine. I very much hope that such a cynical calculus doesn't exist. If it does, it is outrageous. I have to say that given the extent of the disorganization and the amateurism of some of the moves that we're seeing in and around Kiev, I wonder whether perhaps it's just part of the chaotic and disorganized way in which resistance is being organized in various places. Now, that's all I'm going to say about the military campaign, except I would add to a point made both by Gonzalo Lira and to me by Scott Ritter over the course of a programme I did with him um, yesterday. Scott Ritter is, of course, unlike me, a person with an immense military background, long experience in the US military, and he's able to compare uh, war styles. And he made a point also made by Gonzalo Lira, which is that the Russians for whatever reason, have gone into Ukraine soft. By that, Scott Ritter meant that they have not waged all-out war against the country. They have not targeted its utilities. They've not knocked out, as they could easily do, the communication systems, blocked the internet, done any of those things. All of those are operating normally. Gas continues, by the way, to flow through the transit pipes from Russia to Europe, um, unimpeded. The Russians have been extremely careful up to now to avoid causing damage to civilian infrastructure. They've focused instead on defeating the Ukrainian army, obviously because they want to separate it from the um, civilian population. Whether that is a wise political move, whether it's actually an, uh, uh, going to create for the Russians more problems than they realise, well, that's another matter which I'm not really in a position to talk about. So events on the ground in Ukraine may start to increase in tempo if the report that Putin ordered a pause, which he's now cancelled, is true. And one way or the other, I still expect this military campaign to be over fairly soon. Meanwhile, the Western powers have been busy putting together their various sanctions packages. And um, I would say that up to this point, I think the general consensus is that they've not really come to very much. There's been the much discussed um, bans on high technology exports to Russia. There have been the restrictions of operations on some Russian banks. There's been multiple sanctions on various individuals, including now Putin and Lavrov. I don't think any of this is going to concern the Russians very much at all. I would add that it's clear that even as the battle for Ukraine actually began, the European Union had not yet agreed its sanctions package. They were all busy negotiating with each other, and it seems that various countries um, 
managed to carve out exemptions for particular products that they want to continue selling to Russia, with Italy being particularly insistent on this score. But, as I've said elsewhere, in other places, we are in a state of passionate anger in the West. Um, our leaders have become intoxicated, or so it seems to me, by the hysteria. They all seem to be in a situation where each of them tries to show how tough they are and how loyal to Ukraine they are. And it's not impossible, in fact, it's highly likely that we're going to see more sanctions, like conceivably even the disconnection from SWIFT, which hasn't happened, start to be rolled out over the next couple of days. I would say that if that happens, it will not have the knockout effect on the Russian economy that some people believe. It will more probably do irreparable damage to the global financial system and probably spell the end of economic globalization. And that perhaps brings me to the main part of this video, because one of the things which has also happened over the next, uh, over the last few hours, is that the Western powers took the entirely predictable step of trying to get a Security Council resolution condemning the Russian invasion, as they call it, of Ukraine, voted through by the UN Security Council. Now, everybody knew in advance that the Russians would veto that resolution, but there must have been some hope or expectation that other countries would support it and that the Russians would find themselves isolated. Well, China abstained. Again, I think the Western powers probably expected that. But what I think is causing considerable dismay is that two countries important, each important, though in completely different ways, also chose to abstain. By abstaining, of course, they did not support the resolution. And it's important to say that in this kind of situation, a refusal to vote for such a re resolution is a sign that you do not agree with it. It is not a sign of you wanting to sit on the fence. Now, those two countries were India, the second biggest country by population after China, uh, an emerging superpower, one of the world's biggest economies, and a close friend of Russia's. It's also a country which the United States has believed it has made into a de facto ally through the India's participation in the so-called Quad, this grouping that the United States has been trying to cobble together in the, in, in the Pacific region, the Indian Ocean and Pacific region against China. But India has made it very clear that it will not be manoeuvred or pushed by the United States either into supporting any sanctions package against Russia, and it will not support resolutions of um, criticizing Russia either. And that, I think, must have come as a disappointment. However, a third country also refused to support the resolution, and perhaps that was, from the American point of view, the most dismaying decision of all, because the country in question is a long-term American ally, the United Arab Emirates. And we. this is consistent with information from the Middle East. It turns out that all the Arab oil producers, as well as Israel, have refused to take sides in this conflict and have refused to act in a way that is contrary to Arab to, to Russian interests. So Israel refused to supply advanced surface-to-air missile systems to Israel, despite coming under pressure to do so from the United States. King Salman of Saudi Arabia apparently taught, told President Biden of the United States over the course of a telephone call some time ago that Saudi Arabia is not prepared to increase oil production to make up for any shortfalls from Russia. And the Emir of Qatar, 
has said the same about liquefied natural gas exports. So we see that some Middle East countries at least are refusing to take sides on this issue or in practice are tilting more to the Russian side. And here I'm going to make a particular observation of my own. So much commentary in the West has represented this Russian move as somehow outrageous and extraordinary and appalling. And perhaps you feel like that about it too. But from an Arab perspective, from the perspective of many people in the world, but perhaps especially from, from an Arab perspective, there must be some people in the Arab world who ask themselves, why is what Russia why is what Russia is doing in Ukraine so much worse than what the United States has done in a whole succession of Arab countries in Iraq, which it invaded in 2003, in uh, um, Libya, in Syria, in who knows how many other places. And undoubtedly, there must be people in the Arab world who remember the violence and intensity of the American attack on Iraq, which on any objective measure far exceeds that, so far at least, um, on Russia, uh, on uh, that of Russia on Ukraine, and inevitably, some people on in the Arab world must be asking themselves, why is the United States, why is Western opinion so much more outraged by this war in Ukraine and so indifferent to what happened in the Middle East? And I can't help but think that many people in the Middle East will say to themselves that. For all the protestations we've been hearing in the United States um, over the last couple of years, um, for all the things that were said during the protests in the United States in 2020, um, for all the similar protestations that we hear in Europe, in reality, fundamentally and deep down, Western policy makers are not honest on this issue they care ultimately about Europeans far more than they care about people outside Europe who are the target of their wars. Well, that I suspect is the general feeling, but the, the fundamental point is that help from these countries is not coming in perhaps the way that the Americans and the Europeans expect it. Now, is anything going to happen that might change that? Well, I suppose conceivably, if the war in Ukraine evolves into an outright bloodbath, then it might be possible, in part, it might become impossible for countries like the Arab states and India to hold the line. But I think if only for that reason, the Russians will work extremely hard to make sure that doesn't happen. So we shall see how events progress, but it seems to me that